Welcome to Wellness Radio with Dr. Jeanette Gallagher as your host. Her show discusses topics of health, wellness, and spirituality and is about discovering your place in this great universe from your cells to the cosmos. Along with her guest in casual conversation, she strives to ask the difficult questions that may be holding you back from a vibrant life and shares new ideas that may inspire you to make a change in your life that you only can see in your dreams. And now, here is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wellness Radio. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher, and it's a pleasure to have you with us here this evening. Today, we are going to be talking about our mind, our thoughts, our consciousness, our knowing. What is that truly all about? What's going round and round in this brain that's on our head? Perhaps what's also filtering around us in the ethers? Really, what's out there in the cosmic energy? Whoa, is it not truly that maybe one cell plus one cell is what gives us my daily life? Mm. Today, we're truly going to expand our thoughts with Leonard Perlmutter. His book is Your Conscience, the key to unlock limitless wisdom and creativity and solve all of life's challenges. Leonard, it is a pleasure to have you with us here today to talk about consciousness. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette. I appreciate it. You know, Leonard, don't you think that uh, you and I have spoken before several years ago on a topic, don't you think that the world is really expanding its awareness these days in the year 2021 and we're going, whoa, man, now people are kind of getting it. I'm getting more information and we're really tapping into source energy. I believe so. I think that the uh, intensification of pain has had a lot to do with that because people are looking finally within themselves for answers that they could not find outside. Yeah, you know, I also think that, too, perhaps you and I have spoken on this before, is that really the collective, we weren't ready for it then. In other words, in the 70s and 80s, it was not time. Now we look at it in the year 2021, now it's time. So it's more of a collective kind of momentum that's happening in the cosmic energy. Don't you think so? Like, in other words, we can't consistently force something within the energy fields that isn't ready yet. Well, that's right. And part of uh, that which is forcing it is the also the increase in darkness, which intensifies the need for more light, and so more and more people are being motivated toward exploring and experimenting with the light to reduce the darkness. Right, because in essence, you know, people say, well, you know, well, if we knew better, then we should have been better, and then we should have done things differently, and things would have changed. You know, but in essence, just as you said, you know, sometimes we need a little push to go one way, to be able to see there's a potential of another way. Do you think, in other words, sometimes we have to um, hit the wall and keep knocking on it, and then we have some choices. We can sit down and go the other way. We can sit down and have a temper tantrum. We can find a way to take down the wall, or we can find a way to transmute the wall. Don't you think those are all of our options? There are many of them there, for sure, and and certainly pain is the shadow of the outstretched hand of the divine reality tapping us on the shoulder and suggesting to us that for our highest and greatest good, we might want to make a mid-course correction at this time, and that's exactly what we're being asked to do. Yeah, because I think the idea is um, a lot of people are saying, you share in the front of your book, some days are better, some days are worse. Do you think, in essence, what we're doing is we're really talking about that, I call it the lateral kind of linear thing. Um, You know, we're going to swing to one day, one day we're in yin, one next day we're in yang, you know. There's no such um, transcending that, that kind of loop that we're kind of stuck in. It almost seems as if it's a human dogma kind of loop. And what we're truly... Well, I would say that it's... uh, it uh, it is a human, but uh, mm-hmm. it's also animal. Yes, 
Yeah. So uh, it, our our capacity at this time is uh, to use the human mm-hmm. to go beyond the animal to experience the truth and unity of the divine. Right, because that what you just said at the end, the divine, is a transcendence kind of form. In other words, it's sort of like you stand a little bit taller and you can see it playing out versus being one and engaging with it and being part of it, yes? Absolutely. That's why Einstein said that a problem cannot be solved on the level at which it arises. It has to be solved on on a higher level. We cannot find solutions to our problems, quote-unquote, uh, on the same field of action, on the same chessboard uh, from which mm-hmm. they arose. We're not going to uh, change very much if we just keep on pushing the, the pieces from one side of the chessboard to the other. We have to uh, transcend to a higher perspective, and when we change our perspective, we will change our experience. Do you think, so I'm going to just propose something here, a thought maybe. So, Leonard, perhaps sometimes we see it when people are crying out in pain and they are, quote, praying to a God to to fix them, to take them out of it, to transcend them, to dig them out of their hole, but they're still crying from that same point of pain. Is not perhaps maybe the pain is the experience of the moment and then when you're Almost, um, as we say, moving from it, then you look back in retrospect and you kind of can see that from a different vantage point. Is that what we're talking about, too? Sure. That's why we have a rearview mirror in our automobile. Yeah. So we can see both where we're headed and we can see where we've been. And isn't the goal of your book to really say, okay, You've seen it now once or twice. Okay, you kind of got it maybe a few times. And now it's time to ramp up the speed. Now it's time to become it, to be aware, to be in this engaging moment. That's really where you're taking people, don't you think? It's sort of let's not always have to have those experiences. In other words, you can always hit your toe 20 times on the couch till you decide to move the thing, right? (laughs) And my experience has been that it is our conscience Mm-hmm. That is is the key. And that's why I wrote this book, Your Conscience, right. because it is the only function of the mind that can discriminate, determine, judge, and decide. It is the only function of the mind that can access superconscious wisdom from the superconscious portion of the mind and bring it into our conscious mind so that we can learn from it, so that we can base our thoughts, our words, and our actions on this superconscious wisdom which has come from our conscience. Leonard, can we talk about the idea of the law of karma you start in your book? And everybody equates the word karma to something negative, something bad, something you know you want to kick to the curb. But in essence, what do you call the law of karma? The law of karma karma is simply that every thought that we have leads to an action. And every action that we take brings about a consequence. This is what Newton knew when he formed his third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal reaction. So if thoughts lead to action and actions lead to consequences... And we all know the consequence that we want to experience. We want to be happy. We want to be fulfilled. We want to be secure. We want healthy bodies. Then it begs the question, that thought that is in my mind right now, is that going to enable me to Mm -hmm. experience the happiness, the health, the security, the reward? that I deeply desire, or will it delay the prospect and instead bring about pain? So that means that our thoughts are our richest resource, and yet only the conscience can tell us what is the thought to think, what is the action to take, and what is the consequence that will arise 
in ways that will enable me and you and all of our listeners to fulfill the purpose of life without pain, without misery, without bondage. Right, because what you talk about the idea and the definition of consciousness, you're saying with knowledge, with wisdom. So, But also, too, what you're talking about is making those choices from a vantage point of consciousness, as you define in your book, with knowledge, with wisdom. And I wrote on the bottom of the page, where does it come from and whose truth? Well, there's only one truth, and it comes from the center of consciousness. Within the center of consciousness, the core of our being which religionists refer to euphemistically as the soul, there resides an intuitive library of wisdom known in yoga science as the superconscious portion of the mind. The superconscious portion of the mind lies beyond the conscious, beyond the unconscious. It is the same portion of the mind where Paul McCartney hears beautiful melodies, where Albert Einstein saw mathematical equations. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we're going to become songwriters. It doesn't mean we're going to become physicists. What it does mean is if we can use our conscience to determine our thoughts, words, and actions, Mm -hmm. then we can go beyond the pain of human existence. Do you think that sometimes that pain and that suffering is bound up with memories, it's bound up with the past. I always call it as, um, I see the I, the consciousness, as inside and it's um, a ball of glitter and it just glistens. And I really see the human as the wetsuit that we are carrying around the human vehicle. And our experiences and all of the things we've been through are like badges on our wetsuit that are our filters we have to see through. Do you think, in essence, sometimes it's like, how can we diffuse some of those badges and have more cracks through our human wetsuit to experience that consciousness? Absolutely, absolutely. And and what is the mechanism? The mechanism is to understand and coordinate the four functions of the mind, because the mind moves first and the body follows. None of us can even raise our hand over our head without first entertaining a thought. So we need to understand the ego and the senses and the unconscious mind as well as the conscience. These are the four functions of the mind, and they need to be coordinated. At the present time, they are anything but coordinated. In fact, There's a civil war going on in our mind. The ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind have Mm -hmm. caused so much turmoil and conflict in the mind against our own inner wisdom. And it's not malicious. Mm -hmm. It's just that they only have a limited perspective. Mm -hmm. My job, your job... Everyone who can hear this, it's your job to learn to train and parent the ego, senses, and unconscious mind for the sake of an experiment to support the perfect vision and wisdom reflected by the conscience. And the more that we can experiment with that, the The limited perspective of the ego will expand, the limited perspective of the senses will expand, and the limited perspective of the unconscious will expand. And we will become a much more healthy and creative and loving organism. Leonard, can we talk about logic and five senses? That's one of the first that you're speaking about, functions of the mind. When it When it says it's an an importer and exporter of information, in essence, I call that the badges. It's those filters that are stuck, don't you think? Well, uh, but the senses are not the only ones that create these filters. The ego does too, and so so does the unconscious mind. But the senses are, right now, the senses 
uh, and our mind are addicted to sense gratification. So what happens? The mind projects our creative energy through the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth, Mm -hmm. the ears, the hands, and the feet to explore the world in a frantic Mm -hmm. attempt to find objects and relationships that will bring me happiness, bring me security, bring me health. The problem is that the senses only have limited perspectives, and they can only see the front of situations rather than the front and the back. But there's always a back to the front, but the senses cannot see it. So what happens is the senses waste so much of our creative energy chasing after a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow that never existed and never will exist. And it's it's quite analogous to squeezing a tube of toothpaste. When we brush our teeth, we can squeeze the toothpaste tube, and out comes the toothpaste. But it's virtually impossible to put toothpaste back into the tube. And it's the same with our creative energy. It's virtually impossible to to bring it back into this mind-body-sense complex to use it for a higher purpose. So we just keep on dribbling, dribbling, dribbling away our creative energy on wild goose chases. So that's the senses. Right. And the ego is hardwired to the reptilian brain. And what does that mean? Can I ask you a quick question about the ego? In essence, the ego, people think that that's their identity. In other words, that's which makes me show up as the human in this life. Don't well, you think that's, that's right. where that's it's the, stuck? I think the uh, the ego has assumed that that is the case. Why? Right. Because the ego is really in service to the reptilian brain. And right. the two of them together are, number one, all about self-preservation of the form. The ego Mm -hmm. feels the responsibility to keep us alive. And both the ego and the reptilian brain have an intense fear of annihilation. Mm -hmm. And so in service to that self-preservation and motivated by the fear of annihilation, the ego is present in every relationship and always cuts it in half and says, Oh, this is pleasant. I like it. Mm -hmm. I claim that this is good. Let's reprise it. But over here, this half? Oh, this is very unpleasant. I don't like it. I call this bad. Let's eliminate it. And so what happens is the mind becomes addicted to that limited perspective of the ego in service to the reptilian brain. And what do we do? We cultivate likes and dislikes. We become the, our mind becomes very rigid. We only want what we like, and we and we dislike and don't want what we don't like. But our limited perspective already has taught us that which is pleasant isn't always good, mm-hmm. and that which is unpleasant isn't always bad for us. So if if I allow my mind to become addicted to the limited perspective of the ego and the senses and the unconscious mind, I will suffer. Now, the unconscious mind is the repository of all of our habits, our memories, our imaginations, everything that we deem essential to self-preservation. When I have uh, an action to take in Mm -hmm. in the midst of a relationship, the ego senses an unconscious mind very often vote in a block. They create a tremendous amount of noise in the mind. And that mm-hmm. means that the conscience cannot reflect superconscious wisdom from the center of consciousness. But since the conscience is the only function of the mind that can make a decision, When the ego senses an unconscious mind are so loud 
and so pushy and so insistent, the conscience only has one option, and that is to rubber stamp that limited, often faulty advice from ego, senses, and unconscious mind. And you and I experience pain as a consequence. Is not... I almost think of the unconscious mind as this kind of seeker, and it kind of goes out there, and I wrote down that it's validation. In other words, we're always seeking, like on social media, we're seeking a drug that will help us. We're seeking good food that will feel like it fills that pit in the stomach or whatever. So is not the unconscious mind, you know, when you talk about memories and habits, uh, people are even extending it out to, oh, that's my ancestral lineage, or, oh, that's my past life, or, oh, this is that, 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 and that. You know, it really what it's doing is it's kind of a collection of that which settles something that uh, you kind of have been raising the flag for. Do you think? Well, it definitely reinforces the notion that I am the body, and I am the right. mind, and I am mm-hmm. the personality, and all of those are 100% incorrect. It's mm-hmm. not that we don't have a body. We have a body, and we have right. a lifetime relationship with the body. We also have a mind. We have thoughts, desires, emotions. But I am not my mind. I am not my emotions, and yet I have a lifetime relationship with them. How am I going to act with the body and the mind? The key is to counsel within to the highest wisdom that is at the core of our being, to know the thought, to think, the word, to speak, and the action to take. That will unite the two worlds, both inner and outer, and fulfill the purpose of my life. When you talk about Leonard, senses and logic presents its findings in your book. You know, and you say you have two basic alternatives, but is that not operating from still that same linear lateral existence? When you say you have alternatives, it's either right or wrong, or white or black, or green or purple, and you really, really haven't transcended the essence to be able to get to that super conscious wisdom. Because we have not parented our senses. And logic. Mm-hmm. We have not parented our ego. We have not parented our unconscious mind because nobody taught us about how to do that, not in the family, not in any level of any school that we went to. The right. only thing that we were taught is to memorize and recite what we have memorized, and then we would get a diploma and a, mm-hmm. and a better paying job. However, we are still enslaved to these painful obstacles that disallow us to experience true fulfillment. Right, because you really want to talk about, in your book, you say consciousness is always directing us and we already know what to do. Why is it so difficult to hear the message? And that's truly because of that noise. As you, right. you know, if you if you think about the ball of glitter, how can it get through a wetsuit? How can it get past all those badges? It's all of that confusion of that energy source. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so every relationship is is an opportunity to self-examine and let go of one of these obstacles that currently is inhibiting the light. Mm-hmm. How do you say, you talk about purifying the consciousness and optimizing the wisdom. Truly, we see a lot of people, you know, it's been a really good push this uh, past two decades about we need to detox this, that, and the other. Well, I think people were kind of getting a message that there's something that has to go. How can we let it go? Then we looked at, you know, people, um, the year 2020 had a lot of letting go. They had a lot of time to decide. What do they need to let go in their life? A job, a place, a relationship, their health, um, their stuff in their house, whatever it is. So in essence, are we not learning what your book is almost like a forerunner of this template and now we are engaging more of the collective to be able to be aware of the process? Part of the major challenge that we have comes from the culture. The culture defines change as some form of death. It's Mm -hmm. a threat to the ego. It's a threat to the senses. It's a threat to the unconscious mind. 
But our limited experience tells us if we look through the rearview mirror at our life, that change has been happening our whole lives. I remember that body that I had when I was five and the mind that I had when I was 13, neither of which are the same anymore. And yet, I'm still here. So what right. does that tell me? Yeah, It tells me change happens. Anything with a name and anything with a form is going to change. But mm-hmm. change is not annihilation. Change is not death. Change is growth. Mm-hmm. Do you think that in essence kind of, um, for lack of a better way to say it, we were kind of dealt a, a strange kind of hand. We had to learn a cycle. We had to learn life and death to be able to come to the point to know this eternal growth or this eternal existence. Yes, and uh, uh, but we we don't want to look at death. You mm-hmm. see, the culture doesn't want to look at death. The, the culture wants to segregate it because the culture is speaking on behalf of the reptilian brain that mm-hmm. change means death, it means annihilation, you see. And uh, the more that we can see it for what it is and cut through the the false concepts that are being sold by Mm -hmm. the culture. And it's not malicious. It's not malicious. It's Mm -hmm. just, you know, what mom and dad taught me, or grandma and grandpa taught me, and they loved me. Uh, So I just keep on doing what uh, we always did. But not everything that we're doing and that we received is helpful. Right, because it's also true the evolution in which we are existing. In other words, we were never meant to be staying in the same spot at the same time. In other words, there's a whole lot of um, people that say we need to save the past, we need to construct and preserve, and we need to hold it up as um, an icon of where we came from. When in essence, when you're going forward and when you're expanding your awareness and your wisdom and you're, and you're really getting into this other place in time, you know, life insurance doesn't make so much sense, you know. Um, keeping all of the things to give to your kids when you pass on, uh, they don't want it anyway, you know. And then the idea is that um, really what point did all of that uh, stuff that you went through, mm, do you choose to continue with it? You know, a lot of times when people, when they enter um, hospice care or palliative care, they're like, I really don't care about my false teeth. I really don't care about what's on television. You know, they're into a different space and time. So if we look at our existence as just the soul essence, we see how we, it's almost as if we're delving through all these experiences in our human chapter of our book, And we're saying, ooh, tell me something, show me something more. And then it's our choice to be able to say, but I see it from a different place and time. Well, that's right. But we have to be willing to do the experiment. We have to be willing to uh, embrace the change Mm -hmm. and and see what happens. And so that's that's the beauty of uh, using the conscience as our guide. If Mm -hmm. I can experiment with small, seemingly insignificant no-brainers, am I going to have a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock at night just because the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind are reacting to a commercial on television? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to listen to the super-conscious wisdom reflected by the conscience which is telling me that at 10 o'clock at night, the caffeine is not doing you any good, the sugar will not be doing you any good, the half and half will not be doing you any good, the second slice of apple pie from that you had from dinner will not be uh, any good. Mm-hmm. So am I willing to do that experiment just for the sake of an experiment? And if I can, mm-hmm. and I can convince the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind to support the conscience in that decision, then right. the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind will have a pleasant experience that I can build on as their parent. 
because I love the ego. We need an ego. We need a healthy ego. We can't have a conversation like this without a healthy ego. We can't drive an automobile or a truck without a healthy ego. And senses, there's nothing wrong with sense gratification. I have a body. I have senses. Life is to be enjoyed. But Mm -hmm. how do I know what's to be done, when it's to be done, and when it's not to be done? And the unconscious mind is not completely wrong, but yet it it has many faulty concepts. Somebody has to parent our mind, and it has Mm -hmm. to be you and me, because I can't parent your mind, nor can you parent my mind. But if each of us can examine our own mind and parent our ego senses and unconscious mind just as an experiment, turn our entire mind-body-sense complex into a laboratory and work the scientific method as a doubting Thomas. But after I make the decision and the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind support the superconscious wisdom reflected by our conscience, then I'll ask the ego senses and unconscious mind, how do you feel now? Right. And my experience is that they will all say, well, it wasn't so bad, better right. than I had feared, mm-hmm. quite pleasant. Mm-hmm. And so now the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind, together with the conscience are learning a new way of being that can lead us for our highest and greatest good. Do you think, um, Leonard, in closing, we could talk for a second about fear and control? Because if you look at the past probably several years, there's been a lot of experiments on that, about uh, the fear, fear of death, fear of loss, fear of survival, fear of whatever you want to call it. And then control is the control that others are going to save you. And then we learned that the cavalry is not coming. So in essence, it's the idea of uh, that was a perfect example about being able to say, let's go, let's see how far that edge is, let's jump over it, and let's see where we are land. And can we reconstruct and construct ourselves from a better knowing? That's really what you're talking about, yes? Yeah, you know, fear is a tremendous filter in our lives, and President Roosevelt had it right. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear is an emotion that's authored by the ego because the ego Mm -hmm. is terribly afraid of dying. And Mm -hmm. so fear must be examined. Every fear must be examined. And there are always only two manifestations of fear. First, I am afraid I might lose what I have, or I am afraid I might not get what I want. And that Mm -hmm. begs the question, who am I? Mm -hmm. I am not the body. I am not the mind. Birth and death are merely the habits of the body. Mm -hmm. And yet I am an eternal being, pure consciousness, wisdom, bliss, having a human experience in time and space through a mind-body-sense complex. Mm -hmm. And so my job is to unite the two worlds, inner and outer, the eternal Mm -hmm. and the mortal, so this trip can be pleasant, creative, and rewarding. And when we can begin to see who we truly are, that we're not the body, we're not the mind, that we are Mm -hmm. pure consciousness, (laughs) wisdom, and bliss, then we experience the first great freedom, the freedom from fear. So in closing, Leonard, um, people will say, but I can't live a fearless life because we will have people just bouncing off the walls doing all kinds of crazy stuff. How does that fit in? Well, well, we need need, uh, 
to be responsible. We need to uh, take uh, uh, make choices that are going mm-hmm. to lead us for our highest good, not just bouncing off the walls. So mm-hmm. if if the conscience is our guide, if the conscience is our guide, we will never drive over a cliff. Mm-hmm. Do you think our conscious also has a time meter on it, so to speak, because it has us in this time and date, in other words, where we are in this moment in time, because it's not taking us back to this is a 1920 and there's a war outside my door, you know. It's keeping us in the space and time we are in. Because the space and time in which we are in is most conducive for each of us to overcome the obstacles that still exist in our unconscious mind that are crying out to be resolved. Right. And only we can do it. Yeah. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. But we can do it with our own minds to resolve that which is resolvable in the unconscious mind. Well, Leonard, we have all um, learned so much from you today about becoming aware. That's the first step. I always think is becoming aware. Be open to receiving, to giving, to awareness, to knowing what's out there. And we thank you so much. Can you share with the listeners how to find out more information about your work? Because you have several other books and you have a facility in New York and you do ex- extraordinary work. Can you share that? Oh, that's very, very nice. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette. So uh, the book itself, Your Conscience, has a website, and it's yourconscience.org, yourconscience.org. And there you'll find some information about uh, myself and the book and uh, how to uh, uh, purchase the book if that's uh, of interest to you. Of course, the book is available at all fine booksellers, including... Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and even your local bookstore. So that's Very yourconscience.org. And I teach from the American Meditation Institute mm-hmm. uh, in upstate New York, uh, the institute that I founded in 1996. And we have a website for the American Meditation Institute, which is American Meditation. Dot O-R-G, American Meditation dot O-R-G. And if you go to that website on the home page, uh, you'll see a link to our Sunday meditation. And I present a free guided set of, a free guided meditation uh, every Sunday from nine thirty to eleven in the morning Eastern time. And everybody who attends will get a uh, free recording. Very good. Well, Leonard, thank you so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to have you with us to share. Well, I deeply appreciate uh, the honor of being with you. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette. If you'd like to find out more information about Leonard Palmutter, his book is Your Conscience, The Key to Unlock Limitless Wisdom and Creativity and Solve All of Life's Challenges. Please do click on the link on the bottom of today's show page to go directly to his website for more information. And really reach out because he has some extraordinary work, many, many decades that he has on his website. And it's about being able to say it's time to step into something different. It's time to step out of our rituals, our old ways of being and maybe say there is a potential, uh, there is a possibility, and I am aware and open to it. Open the doors, breathe in and out, and be able to say there is something so much more than my existence today. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher, and until tomorrow, have a great day. Today we discuss many life-changing concepts. Who do you turn to and how do you know what is best when faced with a health crisis? Dr. Jeanette is a patient advocate. She listens to the patient, the doctors, and the family, clarifies the health issues and concerns, then helps the patient make the best choices going forward. If you would like help implementing change into your life and health, we can talk and see where you are stuck and how to improve the quality of your life. Check the link on the bottom of today's show page or visit Dr. Jeanette 
www.gallagher.com to schedule a phone appointment today.